Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord and shout with joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving, singing joyful songs of praise. Let us now confess our sins, trusting in God's boundless mercy and grace. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have turned them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us, heal and forgive us, set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Uh May the peace of the Lord be with you. Please feel free to greet each other. Peace, friends.
Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning to all of those of you here in our sanctuary. Good morning to everybody on Zoom. Good to be with all of you today in worship here at Westminster. We had um, such an amazing gathering for the funeral of um, Sheila Holroyd yesterday in this room. And I still feel some of the energy of that, of that service in this room this morning. It was a lot, a lot of love in this room, wasn't there? Just a real celebration of life. It's, it's so good to be a church, to have a church, to be able to be church together during times like that. Thanks to everyone who was part of that, who pitched in, who made it happen. There was a real village that made that service come together. Well, this morning we um, gather again for worship. There's um, uh, still uh, services to come described in this booklet at, that's in the back of the service, uh, back in the sanctuary. Please take one if you don't have it and um, take one to share with a friend. I do want to highlight a couple of things. And one is what's happening this afternoon, which has been a real labor of love for um, a number of people some of whom are part of this church and some of whom are just friends of this church who are in this neighborhood. And this afternoon, um, we're having an event um, that's all around storytelling. And it's a multicultural storytelling event. There are translators coming who are able to translate, I'll see if I can remember the list, um, Arabic, Pashto, Dari, Ukrainian, Russian, French, and Spanish. How about that? And all together, we're going to share stories. There's a storyteller for every fire circle, and we're having campfires, which I did clear with the fire department. There's a lot of discussion about how exactly you can have a fire legally in outside in Center Square, and we are complying with all of their requirements. But we have, um, we're going to sit around a campfire and tell a story to each other, regardless of whether we speak the same language. And that's all facilitated by somebody who is skilled at telling stories. How cool is that, huh? How, how cool is that? And we've um, invited all of our neighbors to be part of it. And in fact, one of our neighbors, uh, whose name is Mary Murphy, who lives on uh, Chestnut Street, just almost, well, within eyeshot of the, um, of the church, uh, she's one of the storytellers. And through this process, um, I found out that I have a neighbor, we have a neighbor, who's a professional storyteller um, and tells stories all around the country. I, I love that we are connecting even more deeply than before with our neighborhood, with neighbors. And then the neighbors tell their friends and other neighbors about what's happening at our church. Isn't that great? That's, that's all happening because of our Westminster Commons program. So one hour, probably more like 45 minutes outside around campfires with chairs. Don't worry, you don't have to sit on the floor. And then we're going to come inside and all of those professional storytellers, there's five of them, three Americans, uh, an Afghan, and um, a woman who speaks Arabic. I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure which country she's from. They are all telling a story about community, about building community, about making a stranger into a friend. And we're going to share those stories together. I hope you can come be a part of that. These Westminster Commons programs are ongoing. We have another one coming up December 3rd. Um, they are all supported by um, a, a fellowship that I received from New America, which is a foundation in Washington, D.C. They're around civic engagement and civic belonging, building a sense of civic belonging. And the full communications team from New America is coming this afternoon. We are like their favorite project. And they're coming with a photographer and with a, a writer. And they're going to profile this program, which I think is great for our congregation, isn't it? So I hope you can come be a part of that. If uh, it seems a little chilly to be sitting around a campfire outside, just come at 5. and come hear the stories indoors. But I hope you can come for the whole thing. It starts as we have every Sunday at 3 o'clock 
a conversation club where we have uh, language exchange with English language learners. Anything else we need to announce? Yeah, we, we are up for having a second hour. This is part of an ongoing discussion about the spiritual practice of welcome that will be in the Wells Room. Essentially right after worship. It may take us a minute to get down there, but you are most welcome to that. Good? All right, well then let's continue with worship. Looking forward to hearing this anthem. Thank you, Chris, for bringing it to us.
God of all power, open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts with a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Help us to hear your voice, to see your ways, and to receive with joy your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to trap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I love it when you read scripture. I, I feel like you always make Jesus sound so reasonable, you know? <laughs> and that anthem, that was terrific. I, that was an anthem. I wanted to give everybody a fist bump at the end of that. That's like a, a high five anthem. Ain't judging no man. All right. All right. So shall we? Let's, let's ponder this one. This is a tough one. Let's pray. God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. For you, Lord, are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So what does it mean to have power? What does it mean to have power? That, that's a question that I always ask early on when I lead one of my alternative to violence project workshops at Green Correctional Prison. It's, it's part of our program, is to talk to the participants about power. And before we talk about power, we gotta define the terms, right? And power is one of those things that you could have a definition in the abstract, but it's really important to know what it's like to experience, right? what it feels like to have power. It's one of those things, you know it when you see it, when you experience it, when you feel it. So what does it feel like to have power? Yeah, Daniel. When you have power, you have the, you have authority to do something. Yeah. That's a good point, authority, yeah. They, when I ask this question at the, at the, at the prison, a, a lot of times we talk about the power to um, get our way, to, to, to be the boss, to be in control. So if we think of authority in those terms, it's the power to have things go my way, the way I would direct it versus having it go your way, right? That's how you know who has the power in a situation is who gets their way, right? At least that's often how we define the power, define power, is we know we have power when we're in charge or where we're the boss. And, and always when I ask the question in prison, that is the answer, probably because everybody who's in prison is very, very clear 
uh, on who has the power in that scenario, right? And who doesn't? Because they're not the boss in their lives at that moment. Someone else has power, and that's the power over them, right? So as soon as we define power in those terms in an ABP workshop, I write it up on a, a, a piece of newsprint, and I say, okay, what we're talking about is dominant power, right? We're talking about the power over someone or something, right? And that kind of power is win-lose power. If I have it, you don't have it, right? If I get my way, you don't get your way, right? If I elect my candidate, your candidate loses, right? That's, it's, it's, these are either or choices. And so we explore that at the, at the, at, at the workshop and I say, okay, have any, uh, like, do you know anybody in the world who has this power? What does it feel like to have this power? When, how do you get this power, right? How do you keep this power? Have you seen this power portrayed in a movie or uh, in a song? Is there somebody famous in history or in our world today who em embodies this kind of power, right? And we fill out all of that information out on a piece of newsprint, and the guys are shouting out ideas because everybody understands this kind of power, right? Do you think you could respond? We were doing that workshop together. Could you think of a famous person who has this kind of power, for example? Could you? Huh? Most likely, right? Who has dominant power in the world? Yeah. I think you probably could think of somebody. We'd fill it all out. And then I always say to the guys, okay, if you wanted to have more of this power right now, today, in this workshop, what could you do? And that brings that lively conversation to a screeching halt until somebody gives the answer that somebody always gives. You know what the answer is? Violence. Through violence, you can get this power. At least temporarily. You could dominate the entire situation by being the most violent person in the room. And then I always say, well, guess what? There is another kind of power available in the world. This isn't the only kind of power that exists, this power over, this dominant power, this power that looks for win-lose solutions. There's another kind of power. And this is power that is, we could call it power with, right? It's, it's power that looks for win-win solutions. And in AVP, we call it transforming power. Okay, so not dominating power, transforming power. This is power that brings everyone up in a situation. Instead of having a win-lose sol solution, everybody wins when you use transforming power. So then, once I throw that idea out, I say to guys, have you ever experienced this kind of power? And it takes a minute. What about you? If I asked you that question, would you be able to answer it? Have you ever experienced transforming power? where everybody becomes more powerful. Paul, you think so? But you know it when you feel it. Paul's bringing out a, a, an experience in Albany some years ago where there was a collaboration of, 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 of bringing together lots of different groups to address an issue, and through the collaboration, you could see this sort of power of everyone in the group grow. Cheryl, you were nodding too. You've had that experience? Yeah. Cheryl is saying as a school administrator uh, that you're trying to achieve that all the time. That all of the staff, all of the students, all the administrators, all the teachers, right, are all becoming more powerful, becoming more effective 
that there's not winners and losers, but everybody is finding win-win solutions in that school. Yeah, so the, the guys talk about things like that. They talk about sports teams, they talk about lifting weights together, they talk about cooking together, they talk about NA and AA meetings, where um, you know, as one person becomes more empowered, the whole group becomes empowered, they don't feel um, the power of the group draining away from some people as other people become bigger and more powerful. Everybody's enhanced with that. We, so, so, so once the ideas come, we start brainstorming. Have, what does it feel like to have this power? How do you get this kind of power? How do you maintain this kind of power? What, 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 have you seen a movie or do you know a song that, that embodies this kind of power that tells, do you know a famous person who really embodies this kind of power? And it's harder to come up with those ideas, but with a lot of brainstorming with the group, we start to fill all of that in. And then I say to the guys, how, if you wanted to have more of this power right now, right now in this group, what could you do? And it's amazing to hear what people say because they know we could build each other up. We could affirm each other, right? We could laugh. We could dance. What if we gave everybody a high five? I mean, before you know it, we've got all the ideas we need about how to have that kind of power. Hmm? And then we remember something that we knew, but always forget. And that is that violence isn't the only way to have power. There is another way, and that's through love. And we know it. The guys in prison know it. People in the city know it. All of you know that. And we forget it. We forget it again and again and again. Huh? So with that in mind, let's look at the scripture that we just read. This, this wonderful story of a time when Jesus confronted people. They came to him, it says in the scripture, trying to entrap him. Hmm? This is a story about a group of people. It's Pharisees and Herodians together. These two groups in Jesus' day who are usually fighting with each other. In this situation, strangely, they have banded together some way in which the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But together, these groups come to Jesus and they've got a question that is going to entrap him it says in our text, right? What's the question? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? It, 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 you know, it's funny the way in which some of these questions come back again and again and again. Now, let's just be really clear. Um, this is a, a very touchy question in Jesus' day for a number of reasons. Anybody guess why it's difficult to, to say, yes, we should... Uh, pay taxes to Caesar? What do we know about this? Is Caesar like a problematic figure at this time, right? Yeah, so, so we've got, what's this, Margaret? They hate, the they hate the Romans. Why do they hate the Romans? They're, uh, there's an occupying force, right? These aren't their people who are in charge. These are other people, and they extract money not to build roads and employ teachers and to, you know, um, build hospitals. They extract money to continue the um, imperial project of Rome, right? They're, they're going to keep on paying soldiers and dominating other people, okay? That's what the taxes are for. And on top of it, Caesar claims to be who? God. Okay? He's, he's God's son. It says so on the money. This is very problematic for Jews who have a very clear commandment not to engage in idolatry. So paying taxes to Caesar is a big, big problem. But what's the problem with not paying taxes to Caesar? Anyone want to guess? <laughs> Paul says, yeah. <laughs> is that what you were going to say? Off with his head? Yeah. I mean, this is not, oh, okay, don't worry, we're going to put, we'll deduct it from your paycheck, right? 
That, that is not how this is resolved. It's, uh, if you don't pay taxes to Caesar, this is an offense against the Roman imperial army, and it, it, you can be imprisoned. In fact, you can even be executed. In fact, you can be crucified. This is one of the charges against Jesus. When it actually comes to his po the point of his arrest and his crucifixion, one of the things he's charged with is not paying taxes. So this is a question that is important, not just to the... Um, not just to the, the Pharisees and the Herodians. This is a question that is important to everybody in that culture. Everybody who's listening in on this conversation, everybody wants to know where Jesus stands on this. Hmm. Tough situation. So what does Jesus do? What's his answer? <laughs> he show, he's, he, he, his answer is... What is it? Mabel's got it. Render under Caesar. That is what which is Caesar and give to God. What? That is that which is God. Okay. Now, the first thing to notice about Jesus' answer, right, is there's not one group who's listening to him that go, yes, and the other group who's listening to him that go, oh, no. So there's some way in which he hasn't answered in a way that allows one group to win and one group to lose, okay? It says that everybody goes away from this conversation. Wait, how? Amazed. That's not celebrating that their side won. Everybody's amazed. So that is the first and, to me, most important thing to notice about Jesus' answer, is there's not a winner and a loser as a result of his answer. And that's our first clue about what kind of power is being demonstrated in this story. What kind of power Jesus is using. Is this a win-win solution? Yes, there's some way in which Jesus is not engaging in win-lose logic, but in win-wins. Okay, so what does he actually then go on to say? We had it over here. He says, well, give me a coin, right? And he looks at the coin, and he says, what? Who's, who's, whose picture, right? Who's, whose head is on this coin? We, we don't have our scripture up on our screen here, but that's okay. You guys are looking at it. And, and so he says, take a look at what, uh, whose, whose picture, his image is stamped on this coin. And he says, you know, well, you can see that Caesar has a claim on this coin because he has his image on it, okay? But then think about it from the same logic. What about me? What about you? Whose image is stamped on us? We're all made in God's image. In fact, where our scripture tells us, and the scripture that Jesus and his community all knew, everyone around there knew and were understanding that we are made in the image of God, that all of creation is made in God's image. So under that logic, then we give to Caesar what has Caesar's image on it, but we give to God what has God's image on it. That's how we know what belongs to God. So what do we give God? Everything, everything, everything. We give God all of who we are because we are made in God's image. See, this, this is a way in which Jesus has navigated competing claims of his day, right? He's, he's found a way to respond to a question that is an either-or, win-lose question, and he's found a way to respond that will not agree to those terms. He redefines the terms of power. He redefines the terms of engagement, and he says, you want to talk about how we act in this world where we have to look through a whole different lens than the one that you have presented, we need to think about first our relationship with God, right? A relationship of love. That's the basis 
of everything else we say or do, including how we respond to the question of taxes. We will not engage with this question on the terms that the world gives us of who is dominating this situation. We are going to engage on the question of how do we transform this situation? How could we exercise transforming power? It's fascinating, fascinating thing to see what Jesus is doing here. Now, let's just be really clear. This passage is interpreted incorrectly so often as being, oh, there's different realms of power in the world. Go let Caesar do his thing, and we're going to have this other thing, this spiritual power or this discipleship community, and it's somehow different from then and different from anything else that the world gives us. We carve out its own space, its own community. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying that this fundamental understanding of love then pervades everything that we do, including our political engagement. This isn't an apolitical scripture. This is a deeply political scripture, but it defines the terms on spiritual terms and challenges the world's understanding of power. Jesus was not a neutral observer to the politics of his day, right? Jesus wasn't a, a neutral observer to the abuses of the um, Roman Empire. He wasn't, he didn't stand back and regard all of the injustices of his, of, 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 of his day with sort of a cool eye. No, he, he engaged and argued and it, he actually challenged so much of what was wrong in his time. But he did so on different terms. He did so with the, on the terms of love, with transforming power. So then comes the question for us. What if we did the same thing? What if we engaged with the world with transforming power? What if we stepped away from every win-lose argument that we're in. And I guarantee you, each one of us is in one right now. <laughs> we're in some situation where we're either winning or losing. Someone has set up those terms for us, and we're trying to navigate those relationships or that institution or that process, trying to figure out how to win in a win-lose situation? What if we defined the terms of engagement differently? What if we challenged the world the way in which Jesus challenges the world and insisted that there is another kind of power, a power that can transform even the deepest conflicts in this world, the power of love? At the, at the end of a lot of these AVP workshops, I do an exercise that um, I love to watch. I, I put a piece of masking tape down the, tape it down the center of the room, one big long line of tape. And then I ask the guys to pair up, shake the hands of their partner, of course, but they're standing, one guy on one side of the tape, the other guy on the other side of the tape. The instructions for the exercise are very simple. And I say to everybody in the room, I say, okay, everybody here has this goal. The, you all have this goal. Get your partner on the other side of the tape. And I, say, I always say to the guys, okay, keep it safe, guys, but get your, get your partner on the other side of the tape. On your marks, get set, go. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Well, some guys do try to pull their partner over. Some guys argue. Some guys try to trick their partner over. Oh, wait, I got to show you something. Sometimes that actually works. I've seen guys play rock, paper, scissors, but there's always like multiple, multiple rounds. Like, okay, best of three. Okay, best of nine. Best, you know, whatever. But every once in a while, there are two guys, and you know what they do? They talk to each other and they just switch sides and they both achieve their goal. 
usually those guys do it within a second or two. That's once they engage with the argument, the fight, the contest, they can't see another way to resolve. But if they start with a different mindset, within a few seconds after I say go, they each just walk to the other side. And they know that they got it. And they look up and down the line of all those other guys. And they can see the difference of the power of love. Yeah. Amen. Why don't I do this up here? And Fatmata is going to lead us in prayer. So why don't you come on up while I just ask the room, are there ways we can pray for you this morning? Concerns or celebrations that we can share with you? Or share with, where with, with the world? What's on your mind this morning? Yeah, Paul? I sure did. So we continue to pray for the Holroyd family and with great gratitude, we lift up all of those who are here yesterday for that service. Other prayers this morning? Oh, oh we pray for John as he faces treatment for stage four lung cancer. Other prayers? Yeah, Sue? Yeah, prayers for those with loved ones in nursing homes, those with dementia or Alzheimer's. I'm going to also ask for, yeah, Margie. Goodness, yeah. For Margie's granddaughter with cancer surgery tomorrow. What, what's your granddaughter's name? For Elise. Yeah, we'll hold her in prayer. And I also would like to ask prayers for my father who's um, facing a replacement of his once already replaced aortic valve and is having testing for that uh, surgery uh, tomorrow. Let me just take a quick look, Fatmata, about if there's anything on our chat. I'm always forgetting to do this, but I do invite those of you who are here on Zoom to offer prayer concerns on our chat. Okay. I don't see any. We'll sing one more time. I just 
hearing you sing that, Chris, I, I, I'm sitting up there. Can you hear him sing? Oh, my gosh. Thank you for leading us in that. Let's sing together the second verse. Gracious God, we thank you for bringing us together today, God, for waking us up this morning. God, we thank you for all that you are doing for us and you continue to do for us. God, we commit the heroic to you, God. We ask for your peace, comfort, and healing over them as they go through these difficult times in their life. God, we ask for prayer for those who are going through cancer. We ask for your blessing, for your healing over them. We ask for the little girl who is scheduled for surgery, God, for cancer. We ask for your prayer, guide her and protect her. Give peace to her family as they go through this difficult, challenging time in their life. God, we ask prayer for the doctors who are going to be performing these surgeries. Be with them and guide them and protect the little child. We commit her in your hand. God, we ask for prayer for John, who is going through cancer, stage four. You know best, God, and you are the healing master. We know he's in your hand. He's your child. God, we ask for your prayer over him. We ask for your protection and guidance and support for his family who are going through this with him. God, we commit our church members to you, our congregation. Be with us and guide us and protect us. We pray for our peace as we pray for peace over the countries that are going through turmoil. We pray for, pray for Gaza, Israel, Afghanistan, Russia, and all other countries that are going through challenges, God, we pray for your peace over them and comfort. We pray for your blessing over our families, our brothers, as we are our brother's keepers. We pray for love among us all. We pray for the role of power in our midst. We ask for blessing and provide for us, God. We ask for prayer for those who are going through challenges with housing, food, finances, God. We ask for your blessing over them and your protection. We ask that you be with our families, those who are not here with us today but plan to be here, but for some reason, they are not able to make it. God, we ask for your protection over them. We ask for blessing and your prayer and love over those who are in nursing homes. God, we ask for peace for them. We ask for your wisdom and your support in their lives. We ask for those who are alone today, who don't have no one to talk to. Only you, God. We ask that they trust in you. Because no matter what, you are at king. You love them no matter what, unconditionally. So God, we commit them to you. Those who are homeless, be with them. Guide them and provide shelter for them. 
those who don't know where their next meal is coming from today, God, that you know. God, we ask that you feed them, clothe them. And God, our children, are we send them to school. We ask for your protection over them as they are in school, God. Be with them and guide them and protect them. Love them unconditionally. God, we ask for your blessing over our pastor and her family, Pastor Helen, especially her father who's going through surgery right now, God. We ask for your protection over him and your healing power. We ask that you be with him and his wife and children and his grandchildren. God, we ask for peace and healing power over them. We ask for your protection and guidance. And as we leave here today, God, take us to our safe destinations safely and with your love. Let's remember where we're going and where we're coming from. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. The last prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our deeds as we forgive our treasures. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the Lord, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. It is good to be here and worship once again. Today, I'm going to talk about our stewardship moment. Christian stewardship refers to the responsibility that Christians have to maintaining and using wisely the gifts that God has bestowed upon us. So giving, volunteering, or otherwise supporting the church helps toward a long-lasting relationship with God. So as stewards, to be a good steward of the gift that God has given each of us, we have to make our pleasures each year for the following projects of Westminster Presbyterian Church. First, we have to pledge, and our pledge helps with operational and developmental expenses. We need the infrastructure, we need light, we need staff, we need water, to maintain the church and operate this church. We also have other projects, like being part of the focus group. We have the breakfast program. And trust me, there are people who live here in America who cannot afford breakfast. And so sometimes just having that breakfast program helps extend God's blessing to others. When God bless us, he expects us to be blessing to others. And our project also in Africa, it helps. We do have healthcare projects. We have our micro loan projects. We have education projects where we pay tuition. We help kids with first aid. First aid. Some countries do not produce, give that to their citizens. And Westminster is helping with that. For example, in Liberia, so many kids die of malaria, diarrhea. 
but at the Kingdom Embassy School, we have our nurse who is there to treat the kids four times in the month, and that has helped tremendously. We have the nutrition program in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Kids go to school with our food every day. So just our pilot program that we implemented in Liberia, which is working out real fine, when you see the picture before and after the younger kids, it helps. So this is a time of the year. As members of the church and stewards of God, to make our pledges and pay our pledges in order to take care of these projects. Thanks, everyone, for all your donation over the years. Let's continue to be good stewards of God. Thank you. Oh, friends, what if people who walked down this street looked at this church and said, that is a powerful place? What if people looked at you walking down the street? People encountered you and said to themselves, that's a powerful person. That may seem bizarre. That may seem impossible. But friends, that is who we are called to be when we become disciples of the one who lived in this world so powerfully, witnessing the power of love. Jesus called us to that same ministry, to that same presence. He called us to challenge the world's terms and to demonstrate, to embody, to personify the power of love. Let's go forth and do that this week. Amen. Yeah.